Hello, and welcome to tonight's Bomber Conversations. I'm Ashley Bigham, Assistant Professor of Architecture here at the Norton School. Um, and before I introduce tonight's guest, I want to remind the audience that during the conversation, you can ask questions or leave a comment um, by logging into YouTube and leaving those in the um, chat box. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, and it's my pleasure now to introduce tonight's speaker, Sean Canty. Um, Sean is an assistant professor of architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and he's the founder of, Sean, of Studio Sean Canty. In addition, Sean is one of the founding principals of Office 3, an experimental architectural collaborative that spans New York, San Francisco, and Cambridge. Sean's design practice approaches architecture through an interest in thoughtful engagements with building typologies and geometries. His work beautifully materializes architecture at a variety of scales, from small pavilions and interior objects to multifamily housing and cultural spaces. In his work, the attention to developable geometries to articulate relationships between an individual and the collective is particularly distinct and a topic which I believe he'll discuss more tonight. Um, so now I will like, uh, I'd like to pass the virtual microphone over to Sean. Um, Sean, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, thank you to uh, Noten for um, inviting me to be a part of the series and um, thank you to uh, you and Eric for um, hosting me uh, this evening. Um, I'll just briefly share my screen. Um, give me a second. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, tonight I'll give a lecture called um, Geometry's Place. Um, as Ashley mentioned, um, uh, Studio Sean Canty um, has an interest in engagements with both um, building typologies and uh, geometries. Um, I also uh, have a, a parallel practice um, called Office of Three, which is an experimental collective uh, between myself, um, Stephanie Lynn, and uh, Ryan Goldenberg, uh, which we formed in about uh, the year 2016. Um, but tonight I'll talk a little bit about my own, my, my own studio's work. Um, and uh, lately we've been looking at um, uh, this idea of combination and juxtaposition. Um, and the projects of the studio kind of aim to rethink spaces of, um, let's say, ordinary life. And so uh, this happens from small scale projects like accessory dwelling units um, to residences of low and um, high resolution. Um, to research and to um, irregular urban infills um, for, let's say, large-scale collective housing. Um, the, the work also is inspired by, you know, both the ordinary and the exception, as well as the intimate and the playful. Um, moments of collectivity um, and gathering are explored um, in the context of, of domesticity, um, including typological investigations around the courtyard, um, in negative space, um, as well as the interplay between um, perspectival geometries and um, and domesticity. Um, more recently, I've been looking at um, how a combination of architectural typologies with, um, let's say, uh, new and ordinary geometries can leverage um, traditional construction methods. So in this case, like clapboard siding, um, brick barrel vaults, um, the organization of solar panels um, or uh, or standard um, standard standing seam metal siding. Um, I have a particular interest in um, working with developable geometries. Um, this started by kind of revisiting uh, stereotomic projections. Um, so let's say in the case of of um, Guarini and, and uh, this trait from his Architectura Seville, um, where uh, um, doubly ruled surfaces here at a toroidal vault um, is um, approximated by a singly ruled surface um, like a cone. Um, and so here, this relationship between um, a geometry that's curving um, in two directions um, to uh, be built had to be approximated 
by um, a singly curved geometry. Um, formally, I'm also interested in how piecing together uh, conical geometry can choreograph new figures from um, a single shape and also allow for the oscillation between um, two different readings of one thing. And so between like, let's say the smooth and the coarse um, or between the axial and rotational as in um, Nam Gobble's uh, translucent variation on a spheric beam. Um, and also between line and circle. Um, the cone also presents, you know, particular kinds of um, attributes, uh, um, I would call certain kinds of geometric adjacencies embedded within it. Um, it's perspectival in nature. Um, there's adjacencies between point, line, and circle, and then also adjacencies of curvature, what one might call stretch circles, um, the hyperbola, the parabola, and the ellipse. Um, and so, you know, my interest here on the one hand is, is a reaction to a degree of formal complexity that um, our current digital tools enable and allow the, the, the architect to kind of create and post-rationalize. Um, but by working with these kind of um, known primitives in particular ways, um, one can achieve a kind of high degree of formal complexity. Um, let's say that's still amenable to um, certain efficiencies of construction. Um, and so actively in the studio, we're doing certain kinds of rehearsals of form. Um, in this case, we're looking at the ways in which um, two cones might intersect a sphere. Um, so how a, 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 a singly rolled surface is intersecting and produces certain kinds of figural intersections um, on a doubly rolled surface. And then in this case, where a doubly rolled surface like a hyperbolic parabola is intersecting a cylinder uh, and producing these kind of figural curve cuts. And so these are kind of active explorations that um, we do alongside of um, actual projects that um, allow us to build a set of techniques um, and a set of ways of operating um, that then um, overlay onto certain kinds of um, projects within the office. Um, this particular project was a exploratory um, speculative project um, that I did with Office 3 called Gallery of Figures. Um, here, um, when we were finalists for the PS1 competition, we decided to um, to construct the fictional gallery and a series of installations in that gallery as a way of maybe rehearsing what we might do in the courtyard of PS1. And so the idea here was, is, was to kind of use these uh, geometries, um, cones and cylinders, um, and use them to produce um, architectural elements or abstractions of architectural elements, like a wall and a canopy, um, like a threshold or a vault. Um, or like a stair that engaged the corner in a particular way. Um, and we're also interesting, interested in how we might draw um, uh, descriptively the, 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 the process of making these forms and figures. And so um, somehow trying to bring the kind of concision and intensity of a descriptive drawing trait of the 18th century um, into um, contemporary practice. Um, and so this question of adjacency or con in conjunction is also something that's of interest to me um, between curves and curves and also between curves and lines. And the way in which um, geometry can choreograph um, certain programmatic explorations um, by situating new adjacencies be um, between both program and forms. Um, and so this evening I'll share some recent work with you um, organized into the categories of pavilions and houses. Um, the pavilions are kind of like proto-architectures, abstractions that are rehearsals in form um, and representation in a way of um, positioning the work. Um, these explore the potential of the ordinary and known geometries um, and let's say their subtle transformations to produce um, newness. Um, so the, the first project is called Anomalous Corners. Um, it was an investigation um, that I did for um, an exhibition called Drawing Codes. Um, it started by revisiting um, uh, Robin Evans and his seminal text, Drawn Stone, and his reconstruction of the Trump at Annette Castle um, in the book, Projective Cast. Um, in this text, Evan relates the role of drawing and representation 
in the formal and material assembly of stone in the 18th century. In this particular in instance, the techniques of stereotomic projection offered the architect methods to understand, describe, and produce new formal compositions with masonry. Key to this investigation is the trump, which um, can be described as a, a splayed conical surface, which often supports a small tower. The trump at Annette Castle was designed by the architect and geometer, uh, Philip, Philibert Delorme. Um, and he leveraged the knowledge of two codes and, and its kind of formation or construction. On the one hand, it was the architect um, and who was dealing with the kind of classical canon. And on the other hand was that of the stonemason. Um, and, and both um, were, were leveraged to kind of arrive at its exceptional form. Um, this developed surface drawing of the Annette uh, trunk illustrates um, perhaps the salient features of conical geometry. Um, its ability to be unrolled flat and the formal complexity um, enabled by the movement between two-dimensional representation and three-dimensional form. And so we might speculate that the drawnness of drawn stone is how DeLorme handled the edge of the Annette Trump. Uh, he constructs a, a squiggle, a doodle, a sketchy edge, um, a continuous gesture of compound curvature and tangencies materializing drawing by means of projection. And so kind of as an elaboration of this technique, I decided to explore my own anomalous corners, um, substituting DeLorme's misbehaved edge for overall misbehaved compositions of uh, trumps and their supporting towers. Um, so each corner, um, uh, each occupies a corner in a unique way, leveraging um, geometric tangency to smear or rub out um, and blend cylinders um, into the flatness of the corner. Um, this produces arrangements which um, are paradoxically protruded and negated at once. So something that appears to be both added and subtractive um, simultaneously. And then as a kind of culmination to this exercise, um, I, I did this, this drawing, which was a part of the exhibition um, that began, began to kind of suggest material organization through line density and line type um, in order to kind of suggest the method of curved and flat panelization. Uh, the next project is the Solid Pavilion, which was in, um, initially designed for an invited competition organized by uh, materials and applications in, in Los Angeles. Um, since that, I, I didn't win that, but um, I evolved the exploration to another site um, and, and program um, while keeping it a similar scale to the initial competition proposal. Um, the competition brief called for explorations of how construction methods or how existing construction methods may inform um, design techniques. Um, and so the proposal was um, inspired by the long history of turret construction um, or turret construction within the American building stock. Um, this is a, a project that I, I, I quite like. It's the National Bank of the Republic um, by Frank Furness. It's, um, it was demolished some time ago. Um, but it is another example of Tourette construction, but one um, which Furness uh, uses radical recombination of styles to merge the Tourette into a unified whole. Um, here, the conjunction of the Tourette and other elements of the facade highlights the way Furness celebrates the relationship of each part to one another. Uh, for Furness, this was um, kind of, uh, this kind of approach was um, foundational to his understanding of the American landscape. Uh, and so while Tourette's are typically adjacent to a building container, um, the Fowler Pavilion uh, makes this auxiliary architectural element um, integral to the design. And so misalignments between the type and geometry happen uh, by embedding the large conical turret within a vernacular shed container. Um, asymmetry and hierarchy are introduced through a subtle distortion of, of plan, which produces three openings that are relatively similar in size and one that is at the scale of a door. 
the plan gestures towards both the axial and the rotational by way of four pin rolling walls which support um, the round to right above. And so in the final plan, you can see the space has a small, simple program with a semicircular uh, bench for, for, for seating, a reflecting pool that can be covered to facilitate performance. Um, and in four walls um, are a combination of stud and metal framing while the turret was conceived as a stressed skin. As one moves around the pavilion, each object, the shed or the turret, is revealed in varying ways, framing and including each other. From above, the gabled roof appears to be in an entanglement uh, or a commingling um, between uh, both typologies. Um, there are two sibling oculi, one in the shape of a teardrop and one in a wedge shape that choreographs the light into the space below. So this is a kind of an image or a reflective ceiling plan um, uh, looking at these two uh, openings um, that bring light into the, the room below. Uh, this developed surface drawing shows how those figures were described and inscribed in 2D um, and then projected back into 3D. And so from the exterior, what you aren't seeing is maybe more important than what you are. What you aren't seeing is that there are two sets of oculi, one inscribed into the gable and the other inscribed into the cone. Um, they work together to pull light into the interior. And so um, what you see is not quite what you get. Um, and uh, really after something appearing both thick and thin um, simultaneously. Um, if you look at the other side of the pavilion, you can see the, the moment where the gable tucks into the interior of the turret and, and how material siding might bring continuity between the interior figure and the exterior shed. The playful pavilion creates a small room for informal gathering, performances, and conversations. Inside light is directed um, through three large openings that are cut into the shed. And then lastly, this image shows that, that moment where uh, of engagement between both oculi, the oculi on the outside and that one that's um, internal. Um, the houses um, explore um, the simulation of different spatial experiences of everyday living spaces through non-everyday shapes. And so geometries are placed to transform familiar typologies towards something unfamiliar. Uh, the house is also de deploy a technique of tangency, one that allows for the A position and fusion of the similar shapes and plan, as in the case of um, Piranesi's Campo Martio, um, in which a radical juxtaposition of form and type are extremely packed to form a new urban imaginary for the city of Rome. And so the first house I'd like to show is the Janus house. Um, which contains two residences in a single volume. The plan of the Janus House arrives at its composition um, by merging key traits of two recognizable housing types um, in a single volume. Um, on the one hand, the axiality of a dog trot home, on the other, the um, centrality of a courtyard typology. The house's twin logic is established um, through the transformation of the dog trot. The dog trot is characterized by a covered open space and two gabled wings. While the dog trot is inherently symmetrical in plan, uh, the Janus House signals this organization, but it's immediately altered. Public spaces are concentrated towards the front of the house, while the two residences concentrate private spaces towards the rear. Organization of the house takes inspiration from other twin organizations, like the two churches at the Piazza di Popolo. Perhaps the most famous exploration of twinning, commissioned by Pope Alexander, the churches were designed and developed by a series of architects from Carlo Rinaldi to Carlo Fontana, and finally um, Bernini. Um, their exterior form belies, belies their differences in plan. One church is driven by a circular plan with the centralized axes. The other has an elliptical plan that is near axial. The elliptical plan of the first church creates a stronger relationship to the piazza while the circular plan of the second church foregrounds a more internal organization. The two residences occupy 
um, a left and right wing whose boundary line is blurred by the relationship of the public spaces and the connection of the courtyard. The insertion of the circular courtyard complicates the didactic parody of the Dolph Trot plan and introduces um, a rich experience into the house's interior spaces. The sublimation of this typological feature in geometric plasticity is the first in a set of Baroque techniques applied to American houses, house forms, exaggerating and contorting primitive forms, which emphasize the parts within the whole and restrain introversion which conceals the relationship of interior spaces. Historically, these sensibilities drew attention to the Baroque orchestration of mass and volume, as well as the play between light and shadow. One of the main differences between a Janus house and a typical dog trap house is that there's no open breezeway between the two house fronts. Instead, the gable volumes pinch together at the front elevation, first compressing the formerly open space to zero then replacing it with a shared conical awning as though the interior and outdoor spaces were collapsed by a compressive force. Um, and so these are a few um, descriptive geometry drawings um, looking at the um, development of the central drum, its conical roof, the rolled surface. These are a few exterior perspectives. And um, the circular courtyard reads as a, maybe an almost execution of a literal throughway um, caught at the end of an acute angle in plan. And so the courtyard acts in tandem with the exteriorized awning. Together, both typologies, the dog trot and the courtyard, um, enable a mixture of organizational gestures between center and edge. The courtyard um, conceptually is a, is, and programmatically is shared by both of the two residences. Um, bedrooms and other um, public and private spaces uh, um, look through it and past it um, in varying ways. Um, this was um, a, uh, a project that you know, we were after um, earlier in the summer called the Art Farm Farmhouse. This is kind of more of the show, a little bit of just kind of process. Um, uh, the 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 site was located in upstate New York. Um, there was an existing house which was designed to act as an art object in conversation with um, other visible art throughout the site. Um, and the new house um, was to combine two residences um, for two different couples and their families. Um, and so uh, this is where the main residence is located. Um, the new residence um, uh, was not located in the clearing. Um, and we were really interested in this idea um, that was uh, constructed and developed um, in the landscape by the landscape architect um, to produce um, a set of concentrated um, open areas um, for the viewing of art. Uh, and so that was conceptualized as a series of, of light rooms, which were um, tree clearings um, in the round that um, produced an, an exterior room for the viewing of art. And so you can see that here um, in the photograph on the left. Um, we looked at different uh, organizations um, between the collective and the individual, um, trying to map the circularity of the tree, tree clearings to the geometry of, of our proposal, thinking about how a circle sets up um, different relationships between uh, the center and perimeter, the individual and collective, um, centrifugal and centripetal, um, and, uh, and how we might then produce a kind of gradient of, uh, between these kind of conditions. Um, and then also thinking about um, how one subdivides a circle. Uh, would the rooms be radial? Would there be a series of orthogonal rooms that are packed into a circular perimeter? Um, a Cartesian organization inside a circular perimeter um, or a series of self-similar rooms um, efficiently packed into a curved perimeter. Um, and so we presented a series of options for um, the area of the site, um, each thinking about the collective and uh, uh, 
collective and private space, um, what's communal, what's residential, and then what's open. And I'll just kind of click through these. Um, this one was called the double bar courtyard. Uh, this was called the single bar courtyard where the families would be connected and close together. This was the split bar where they're sectionally um, separate and close together. Um, the horseshoe connected and apart. And the coil where they're connected and close together. And so just thinking through, even though um, these are two relatives, thinking about how could they, um, in these massing studies, how could they have certain degrees of privacy um, and certain degrees of collectivity uh, within a single massing? Um, this led us to, to um, because of the kind of contingencies of site um, and budget, to um, try to think both um, tectonically uh, and strategically about um, the construction of roundness. Um, and so we developed this speculative project called the Round House that's still ongoing. Um, this is a work in progress for a prototypical home um, using stressed skins and cross laminated timber. Um, as usual, the, the process starts um, with a cone and in particular, um, thinking about uh, the process of folding a circular figure in order to produce implied subdivision and plan um, through this formal operation. This subdivision also helps to organize two residences within the same volume. The cone is folded successively onto itself, producing a disc that has a series of ridges. And this was done a number of times, producing different kinds of conical folds with different levels of intensity. And so the conical folds are then um, intersected with planar folds that then produces a patterning on the surface of the geometry. Um, from these tests, we developed the final version that concentrates um, two moments of formal complexity. And conceptually, this house is defined by two horizontal planes, the roof and the ground plane. This also acts a little bit like a metaphor for the logic of assembly where the house's walls are sandwiched between the ground plane and the stretched skin roof. Um, the figural fidelity is concentrated towards the roof as the defining element, with the rest of the spatial subdivision kept relatively simple. Um, so as with a lot of the previous work, um, this project considers the role of stressed skins and enabling curvature through traditional building practices alongside the balloon framing and CLT blanks. Um, and so the roof um, remains slightly oversized um, to provide a generous porch around the perimeter of the building. The wraparound porch also provides um, a level of privacy that is distinct from the shared central courtyard. Um, familiar levels of privacy between exterior and interior, um, let's say are inverted in this case. Um, inside the building has rotational symmetry organized around the central courtyard. The public and private spaces of the two residences alternate in plan and the fenestration in the courtyard and on the exterior of the building play with the expansiveness of both views and orientation. Um, and so these are um, a few diagrams from the engineer at KT that we're working with to develop this, um, uh, kind of thinking through a logic of construction um, with the internal walls and uh, being made of CLT, cross laminated timber, um, even and the curved exterior walls. And then um, how the uh, stress skin roof um, locks the form into shape. And then these are some um, kind of process renderings that are um, uh, looking at the relationship between the, the courtyard and the, and the residences. And then also thinking about how curvature begins to produce zones of space um, that doesn't necessarily always need to rely on um, subdivision, but um, how curvature can make one space feel like two or three spaces. Um, the next project I'd like to show is the Concord House. 
um, this project draws its name both from its location, but also the concordance of um, subjects and geometries that um, are working together to produce the whole. Um, this house is situated at a corner lot in which its property lines are not parallel. And thinking about the packing of um, three residences in one volume, the main house, the main move is to think about introducing a degree of connection and separation. Um, this is made possible by the introduction of the interior commons um, that, well, that are, that's for all three residences to, sh to share um, internally. Um, geometrically, this commons takes the, the shape of a circle, um, which contains a series of negotiating centers um, in off-axis circles, a circle, an off-axis circle that makes way for access to a second level, um, and a sec circular stair connecting both levels of the commons is the third center. Um, the entrances um, to each wing are placed tangentially to the circular commons, and as a result, the two wings of the house are able to rotate around the commons and in line to be parallel um, within the respective lot edges. Three distinct residences organize the building inside the volume, um, and they share formal and organizational logics, but they vary in scale. On the left is a two-story residence with its own internal staircase. On the right is a self-contained larger flat. And upstairs is a second floor. Uh, upstairs is the second floor of the two-story residence, as well as the third smaller flat on the right. At the roof, the commons is articulated through a gabled figure that tucks into the roof in two distinct ways creating a connection to the exterior. As you move around the house and the exterior, you can see the conjunction of axial and centralized figures that make up the overall volume of the house. The front facade subtly bends and contorts the convex exterior, while the elevation along the back produces a concave corner. And these are some exterior perspectives showing the, the front entry and showing um, the condition on the, of the, of the, at the rear of the house. And then a few sections that are um, here, we're cutting through the, the internal commons and um, residents, the residents two and three. Here we're cutting through the commons, um, which has a kind of up upstairs um, library, the, the lower level is a kind of um, flexible space. And then we can also see the staircase um, that um, allows for the second story residents to, um, to, to, to access their, their entry above. And this is um, cutting through residence number one, um, which is a two story residence. And then these are some um, in progress perspectives. Um, and so the, the last and final project I'd like to show today is the Barrow House. Um, the project started with the iconographic arch and which was used to produce um, both subdivision and plan and space with distortions and section. Um, the spine of the house is defined by two barrel vaults and a series of thick walls. The areas um, in the house are articulated through four tangent planes that slope between the central barrel vaults and the perimeter wall. So this is a kind of exterior model shot um, looking at the, the series of successive walls that um, subdivide the plan and then uh, we can see the, um, the inscription of the barrel vaults on the um, short elevation um, and then the tangent planes that are tilting between um, those vaults and the um, exterior perimeter wall. Um, from the exterior, these sloping planes are visible um, above and between the thick uh, walls and um, in this first image we can see here the entrance um, towards the center of the home. This is a uh, perspective of the of the of the short elevation in which the um, barrel vault inscribes itself um, 
onto the exterior facade. It acts as a bit of a embrasure, both um, both breaking or puncturing through the kind of thick wall, but opening up the interior to the exterior in a very uh, precise way. Um, and then in the plan, the house is organized into four quadrants, um, a quadrant for living, a quadrant for sleeping, a quadrant for making art, and a quadrant for guests. Um, these quadrants are connected by in-between spaces, which um, sit somewhere between a room and a corridor in scale, and these spaces um, become quiet, um, quiet niches for solitary work um, and or um, some more back-of-house functions. Um, inside these in-between spaces are defined by the archways, and these archways act as deep embrasures that are um, maybe more thought of conceptually as a kind of ex uh, attenuated threshold um, that brings light through the house um, and less so about um, view. Um, and these archways lastly resonate with the punctures of the exterior facade um, that accompanies the windows at both ends of the house. Um, and so um, these spines kind of gather and collect the, the vaulted spines um, intersect at this uh, central zone that's the kind of um, knuckle of the house uh, uh, or the foyer um, where you can look into each of the four quadrants. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was really great. Um, thanks so much. I, I want to just yeah. remind um, the audience watching um, that you can place questions or comments uh, in the chat on YouTube, um, and I will relay those to Sean so you can just log into YouTube and type in any questions you might have. Um, for Sean, but I will um, get us started while others formulate questions. Um, Sean, I wanted to start with a question actually about your representational style or the, the representations that you showed tonight. So um, on one hand, I think your um, drawings are inc incredibly precise and clear um, and very direct, the black and white diagrams, the black and white plans. Um, and then on the other hand, there are representations that um, or maybe more kind of sneaky or um, possibly, uh, I wanna say just deceptive as a positive, um, but there are uh, renderings, I think, um, there's photorealistic renderings, of course, which which is a style that we're very familiar with. But then I think if I, if I understand the images correctly, there are also um, renderings of image of digital images, which are models which are not physical models, but are renderings of physical models. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can kind of talk about your approach to those different types and uh, the kind of um, decisions which are made to decide when you're going to build a model, when you're going to digitally render a model, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Um, and uh, actually one I've been kind of thinking about uh, a lot actually. Um, the representations do different things in terms of understanding the, the, the project for me. And so um, the reduced diagrams are kind of maybe trying to understand the party and organization. The, um, the plans are playing heavily, heavily in terms of thinking about organization. The photorealistic renderings are really about the kind of spatial experience and, and questions of materiality. And then there is the, what you, let's say the faux model shots um, or the um, realistic fake <laughs> model shots um, are something that I, um, that I use quite often to maybe calibrate certain decisions of how the geometry and the form um, are, are snapping together. And there are some wares um, between uh, the subjective representations and the objective representations for me. Um, 
and and I think that's heavily informed by um, let's say uh, artists like Thomas DeMond um, or James Casabier, um, uh in which in, in which the the real is re simulated through um, a miniature in a particular way. Um, uh, and, and I find this kind of um, collision between the objective and the subjective in those, in those artists' work um, quite fascinating. Um, there's something so super realistic about them and somehow you feel kind of at a distance. <laughs> um, and so trying to conflate those two um, uh, modes of perception is, is really useful to me. Actual models, physical models um, in the studio are are really used to kind of question scale um, um, that that's is still I, I find quite challenging to to assess in in three d um, but yeah, I think those those kind of hybrid representations are are really trying to conflate or um, are the moments where um, I'm looking at the objective and subjective um, uh, in in one representation and and that Maybe that's because I'm just more um, facile in, 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 in thinking through that, but I can situate the camera in digital space differently than I maybe probably would um, physically. Um, and, and so you get these kind of odd collisions of something that is seemingly trying to be subjective, but also you know, pulled out from the, from the form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. That that's um, really clarifying and um, super interesting to hear. Um, on the lines of representation, also because I like the way you describe that as um, almost part of your process, right? Whether you would which kind of representation you, you would be working on is like which stage in the process and how you want to start thinking through a particular project. And I also have a question about. Um, the way that you use typology and maybe also specifically the way that relates to um, the fact that most of the projects you showed tonight are houses and, you know, how you see the relationship of typology and um, work on housing and domesticity, are those um, kind of completely linked for you? In, in other words, almost is everything a house or is, is every you know, good idea going to be played out in a house or um, is it quite the opposite in that um, those allow you to focus on very different aspects of a project? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think at, at any scale of, of operating, I think typology will always be somehow formative because it's the thing that I think that the geometry is trying to disrupt um, very consciously um, in the process. Um, and perhaps as you see in the later house, there's maybe a, a departure from the image of domesticity in the barrel house, let's say, um, and more reliance on the, the, the geometry, although it's still adhering to a very strict kind of four square organizational pinwheeling plan. Um, I don't see those things entirely intertwined, but I think that, um, types, um, color has relationships that are are calibrated and that could be questioned those calibrations can be questioned um, um, but I see them as a kind of um, baseline to kind of start with and then to kind of um, manipulate um, um, in particular of opening up the types to, to questions of collectivity um, beyond the single family home yeah that's great that was um, just transitioned into my next question, which was, I, I had noticed um, strikingly that many of your houses are um, not single family, although they're detached houses, but they're not single family homes. And I think that related beautifully when you were talking about the individual and the collective. And maybe you could just expand a little bit on your um, interest in multifamily housing or maybe kind of multi-person housing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm really, well, one, I mean, I'm interested in the question of if I, um, as a, as a young homeowner, what kind of, um, what kind of spaces would I want to own outside of the city? Um, um, and what are the opportunities of thinking about um, co-ownership um, and living together that might um, maybe bring a, a kind of broader range of uh, this equity, you know, so that to, more people can own homes if there are more, um, more, uh, more typologies that weren't um, solely about single family living. 
Um, and so I think here, particularly in the United States, I think we have to kind of rethink single family zoning. Some cities are starting to do that um, so that we can build more densely on, um, on um, exurban or suburban lots. Um, and in doing that, I think we do have to think about, you know, um, does it still mean people are compartmentalized into their 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 own dwellings, or does that open up a new space of of, of being together um, uh, or learning to live together and sharing certain kinds of resources and certain kinds of spaces, um, and st still having moments where we can kind of get away and, and be in solitude? Thank you. So we have a couple of questions um, from the audience, which I'm going to relay now. Um, and the first one comes from Dorothy Bear, who is the director of the Knowlton School. And she asks, um, thank you for your beautiful collection of quote ideals. Several of your references, um, Nam Gabo, descriptive geometry, are highly dependent or responsive to light. Can you speak about that aspect of your work? Mm -hmm. um, I think... Uh that aspect is actually trying to think about negative space. Um, and I think moving from, let's say, a stereotomic idea of descriptive geometry to like how we might think about how that's applicable in the context of, of um, American building practices is how do you think through the thin or, or layering up the tectonic. Um, and so trying to find moments of threshold that, um, that um, move light in particular way, ways, um, um, which um, also try to take less pressure off of um, fenestration in a conventional sense or, or, or windows. I think on one, one hand, these kind of moments of high intensity within each of the projects are trying to form and craft thresholds that then alleviate the facade from doing all of the work um, of bringing light into the interior of the spaces. Um, and so if someone like Michael Heiser's double negative is incredibly inf informative in that sense of thinking about something that um, has a kind of uh, multivalent idea of, of negation <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and thinking about um, different kinds of voids in the project and how they're, how they're operating to bring light, light into the interior. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, so another question comes from Corey Roach, uh, asks, uh, first, I appreciate your work and projects that you've created, humbles and aspire, inspires me and a lot of my peers as well. Um, and his question is, what are the important issues and challenges, challenges that you experience when creating a project? Oh, um, I mean, there are many. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's site, of course. There's the there's program and, and, and the maybe the um, yeah I guess the rituals of the client the rituals of living that they 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 want um, and and then of course there's my own kind of agenda that I I'm will say I'm not I haven't been an expert in smuggling it it in there even though it might look like that but. Um, trying to get these things to kind of work um, together uh, and, uh, and, and um, not compromise the initial idea or the, the initial response to the brief. Um, so I think those are all important. I think the program is important. I think the, the response, the site, I think of course budget is very important. Um, budget is very important. Um, and, uh, and then how do you find the opportunities for um, your own agenda or, or architectural idea to, to map onto those, those other things first? Um, those other things that come first in the, in the design process, yeah. Great. Um, so Beth Blostein asks, um, she says, your work is beautifully devoid of much entourage. This is especially interesting in the context of a house. Can you talk about this decision? I haven't, um, to be honest with you, I haven't quite mastered this yet, uh, but somehow uh, mastered this in terms of the representation is, is somehow letting the objects of, of daily life stand in for um, the representation of physical people. Um, so I, I would say that 
but there's some architects that do this better. Actually, Thomas, Thomas DeMond does this in, in quite an interesting way. If you look at his work, um, that it, it seems like someone had just left the scene. Um, uh, um, but I would say, you know, someone like Lutchen's Padmataban, um, Swiss architects, they do this quite well. Um, uh, where furniture or, or objects stand in for use and, and, and people. Um, so I haven't, I haven't quite gotten there yet. It's, it's something that I've been trying to work on in terms of the, the subjective representations of the project. Um, uh, but I do think it's important, um, actually. So. Yeah, great. Um, and the last question that we have in the chat comes from Peter Boyer. He says, um, does Studio SC look to specific forms in the natural world, i.e. biomimicry, to um, guide specific design goals? And if so, what are examples? And if not, what are other sources that inform or inspire your design process? Mm. Um, no, uh, but um, uh, I definitely look a lot at visual art. Um, and I also look at, um, I find that maybe some of the architects that I am consistently re re revisiting um, and uh, is Ventori um, and uh, Shinohara um, in, in thinking about um, how they deal with both the vernacular and the abstract um, uh, in the space of domesticity. Um, uh, but definitely a lot of the, a lot of, um, visual artists, um, a lot of paintings and, and thinking about affect and color and, 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 and form and a lot of sculpture too, but not so much bio, um, biomimicry. Mm -hmm. So um, we have one more uh, comment here from Todd Gannon, who uh, says, I'd like to hear more about the relationship between collectivity and geometry. Um, on the one hand, there's a Rossi meets Scott Cohen geometry typology interest, which is very exciting. On the other idea of duplexes, triplexes. Um, so would you like to expand um, on any of those thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I would say certain forms set up certain um, kinds of relationships to space. Um, for me, a circle is very different than a, um, an ellipse. So an ellipse has two centers and therefore it's more axial and maybe more um, singular in the direction in which it's, it's pointing versus a circle reinforces a center in a particular way that everyone can look to. Um, so I, uh, so I, I think geometries carry with them certain kinds of baggage that, um, that can be leveraged for um, singular experiences versus individual experiences. I also think that there's a kind of um, gap, um, which is um, particularly not my body of research, but definitely is out there. I'm called the missing middle of housing um, that perhaps was um, maybe more prevalent and perhaps by necessity um, in the past um, of housing multiple people um, in a single residence that we don't have so much today. So we either have the, the extremes of single family housing or we have um, uh, super dense collective housing, but very few things in between um, uh, and definitely not so much in suburban areas. In urban areas, we can find um, duplexes, triplexes, a little bit more common, but not so much in terms of thinking about um, suburban st structures. Um, so part of for part of the project is trying to kind of um, revisit that space and think about alternatives to um, typology or stealth density that um, might allow something to look like it's for one single family, but actually smuggles in um, many. Um, and that hinges a little bit on the image of type and it hinges a little bit on geometry too. Mm -hmm. Great, fantastic. I think as we um, wrap up, there are just a couple of students who have posted some comments. Um, uh, so Christopher Scott writes, as part of the sophomore studio this year, um, I did a project on the Janus house. And after listening to this, I'm even more fascinated with your blending of geometries, truly amazed. So I just wanted to pass on that 
um, uh, you've amazed our students. And so thank you again for joining us. And as a um, related comment, um, Nidos Anochi writes, um, just wanted to say your work is amazing. Would you say your process is driven more um, as sketching or more uh, digitally technique driven? So maybe you can just, for the students who I know have been looking at your work um, this semester in precedent projects, um, kind of wondering how you uh, work, maybe you could just give them a little hint. Yeah, I mean, I don't um, sketch so much anymore. Um, I would say um, early in the presentation when I was looking at the rehearsals of form, um, I, I, that's my sketching. You know, I, I build up certain kinds of techniques and then I kind of store them away and I revisit them um, when applicable. So I have a whole um, archive of, of um, ways of working <laughs> with certain types of uh, geometric figures that, that I kind of just build up. Uh, I built up over the years and I, I kind of um, revisit. Um, so becoming an expert in them, but to kind of like no ends or means um, initially. And then when the opportunity presents itself, a site or a program, then revisiting a particular technique and then trying to see if it has application for the particular problem at hand. But it's a, it's a kind of form of digital sketching versus like um, physical sketching. Um, but sometimes I do that too. Right. Yeah, sketching can take all forms. Um, well, mm -hmm. Sean, we want to thank you so much for um, your time and uh, an amazing lecture and very wonderful conversation after. Um, so we'd just like to thank you again from the Milton School for joining us tonight. Um, I'd also like to um, let the viewers at home know that um, immediately following this um, broadcast, there'll be a short um, announcement from our student publication 112. They want to make an announcement about their um, upcoming uh, publication, which they are accepting um, uh, texts for. And so that will immediately follow. But um, right now, again, we want to say thank you to Sean. Thank you for having me. Bye. <laughs>